which is currently out on audio and will be out on ebook when uh 29th of april so a month today i think yeah yeah if you could uh start off by telling us a bit about it please yeah um so it it kind of it picks up where i left off pretty much in in fire watching which was a debut novel that came out last year um the the main story involves uh well a metal detectorist who is digging around sheffield's botanical gardens in the middle of the night up to no good and he stumbles across something he doesn't intend to in the uh in the guise of a, a buried corpse so um it's it's kind of the ramifications from there um and of course my lead character ds adam tyler's back with his protege nina and um and they have to investigate what's happened to this this body that's found buried in the gardens meanwhile he's slightly um distracted by uh sort of following up on his private life which i won't go into in too much detail because yeah. you didn't read fire watching um but it uh it picks up from there and, and sort of carries that that strand of the story on yeah um but yeah i mean it is you you can read it as a standalone um i, I give enough recaps hopefully that you'll understand what's going on um, you do, if you've yeah. not read fire watching then um pick that up too <laughs> yeah um um, fire watching uh, and Nat Hawking are very unique plots. Uh, where did you get the plot line for Nat Hawking from? Um, I don't know, to be absolutely honest with you. I came across the term Night Hawking years and years ago, I think possibly on some Radio 4 programme I was listening to, or a magazine I'd read yeah. it in, or an article I'd seen somewhere. And I just liked the term and thought it was an interesting idea. So Night Hawking is the is illegal metal detecting basically it's people who go out usually under cover of darkness and um, dig up treasures on private land and then sell them on for for personal profit and it's a fairly significant crime i think they they reckon that there's about twenty thousand metal detectorists in the in the country most of whom are law abiding but i think it must be tempting if you dig up something that might be of value not to do the right thing and turn it into the authorities and and I, I i just like this idea and i thought what what an interesting idea and then of course because it's a murder mystery um yeah. i thought well obviously it's not going to be as easy as just buried treasure there's got to be there's got to be a body thrown in there as well so that's kind of how it started um and it grew from there i must admit i was con a bit confused by the title to start with because there's also a us term which is filming of um news events which is also not called night hawking and got a film based on it right yes there was a i think there was a tv series years ago called yeah. the night Hawker, wasn't there um yeah so yeah but i liked i like to confuse people and keep it interesting keep you on your toes <laughs> well it's it's um definitely different because you like to the way you open the plot from the point of view of a possible perpetrator in in both books why did you decide to do that why uh, why did i do what sorry from the from the point of view of the, of the possible of the killer, yeah. if you like um yeah. i like books that follow multiple points of view um it's the reason i don't just have my main detective you, you also hear things from um uh, mina rabani who's the um police constable uh, detective constable now in the new book um and um, I like to sh I like to show things from different avenues, but I also like to write. My, my writing style is very much close, personal, third person. So I like to really get into people's heads, which is great because I find that you can explore what motivates people and why why they're doing the things they do. But by doing that, you limit how much you can get across to the audience because the character can only reveal to the audience what the character knows. Um, it's not like a a more sort of general point of view where you can dip in and out of other characters heads and things like that so inevitably i find i need at least three sometimes four points of view in order to to kind of get to all the bits that i need to um there are moments in night hawking for example where the reader knows more than the detective um so you you're getting a bit of extra information 
and getting to to put things together so i i guess that's why um and it, i i also like to have one character where you don't whether it's they're definitely not police so you get a yeah. different sense of the impact of crime on on real people rather than just not not that police aren't real people but you know what i mean um yeah, I do, pe yeah. civilians so so you get to see really the ramifications of crime and and how it how it affects all people what what was it what was it that made you decide to do a police procedural because i know you still work in the bookshops you must have loads of uh, different ideas for possible crime novel what was it about police procedurals that um, I didn't intend to. Um, I didn't even intend to write a crime novel originally. I was just writing a book and I needed a plot. And I came up with one by just sort of throwing a body into the mix um, and realised I was writing a crime novel. And then I thought, well, I need someone now to investigate the crime. And it kind of evolved into a police procedural, really. Um, but I embraced that and went with it and, and I'm glad I did because it's great because you can bring those characters back again and again and, and explore who they are as well as sort of the, the crimes that they're investigating. Mm -hmm. um, but I do I do write other stuff. I, I'd written, um, I wrote a fantasy novel before, uh, well, sort of in between the first few drafts of Firewatching and the final draft, I wrote a whole nother novel, which was a fantasy novel based in the 1930s. So, um, yeah, I like writing all kinds of stuff. But I think I, I sort of grew up reading a lot of crime and um, watching a lot of TV crime and, and things like that. So it's always been quite close to my heart. I think they're, they're really good um, classic stories, aren't they? they it's, it's, that, yeah. it's that kind of who that who done it it's it's really there's something really visceral about it that, that as a reader i love sort of delving into finding out who who could have done this and why and and trying to work it out yeah what was it about cold cases cold cases that attracted you because that's that's a theme that's been popular that is it fluctuates between um i think and it seems to have come back again since that Val decided to do it, but um, it's fluctuates in popularity. Yeah, um, I think it was more that I needed, I needed a, a specific area that my uh, detective sergeant. So when we meet Adam Tyler at the start of fire watching, he's kind of in disgrace a bit. He's he's not um, well thought of amongst his peers. Um, so I needed an area that he was solely in charge of, um, that perhaps wasn't everybody else's priority um, and I knew that in real life a lot of cold cases are sort of delved into by retired police officers and yeah. it's kind of seen as a almost a secondary um, investigative strand so I thought that might be quite interesting that he's he's been given something that no one else really wants to do but but is running with it and, and making a success of it and of, all, of course it gives him a chance to kind of get involved in other things as they crop up you know there can there can be elements connected to cold case crimes um and and sort of bring them in uh, if if you just have a straight murder going on then i i guess my my reasoning was the team would be a lot bigger and and i did i, I just wanted yeah. to focus on him and maybe one or two other characters and not not kind of the entire um murder team so, uh, with that, with that in mind, um, what is it about Rabani that allows you to look at a different side of policing? Um, Rabani, well, obviously she's um, she's Asian, she's Muslim, um, so she's a bit different to the average kind of uh, character you, you tend to see represented on the page. But um, she's for, first and foremost, she's a Yorkshire woman, and I wanted to kind of represent that strong feisty yorkshireness that i see around me every day living in sheffield and um so it, it kind of came from there um she sees things very different to tyler um and that is useful and I, I often try and show the same scene from both their points of view so you get to see a different take on it um he's he's very obsessed with certain things and she's perhaps a little more um focused on others she's very career driven in a way that he isn't so much he's more 
interested in finding out the truth, whereas she wants to get on and, and kind of do well and has a lot to prove. Um, and also what, um, what links them is that they're both kind of outliers. They're both characters who who are sort of stand out as being different within the within the force, obviously, because he's gay and she's Muslim. Um, and it's, it's that that's fun to play with that the, the similarities that they have, the things they have in common, as well as as the differences between them. And the, the, of course, this is D.I. Boss to Doggett, Doggett, who is very, very different. He's been in the force longer. What does an older character have that allow you to cover that a younger one doesn't? Yeah, well, he has obviously he has the experience, and and he he often brings um, a, a more traditional kind of approach. I, he, he's a bit of an old dinosaur in a way, and and he started off very much as a, a as a bit of a caricature of the classic police officer, you know, the hard smoking, hard drinking, Rain Mac officer from the 1980s, the things that I used to watch growing up. But um, he is more complicated than that, and and you see that quite quickly. I think that that he he's he cares about what he's doing. He's he's gruff. He tells people off he's he's not particularly nice um but he he does care he very much cares on on the result um and it, it's again it's a different kind of i suppose he's representing the 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 traditional um and the and the others are a, a bit of a more modern take on on modern policing hopefully yeah i think that definitely works and with the with the new book he kind of develops a bit um character development over two books has that been more complicated for you um not really they i think i mean the great thing about obviously writing second books difficult because you've um the first one you've had any length of time so i wrote the first one over kind of 10 years pretty much um in various draft forms and putting it away for a while and then doing something else and coming back to it as the second one i had a, a year to do it um, but the great advantage is you already have a cast of characters and you know roughly what the structure is going to be and uh, because you want it to be roughly the same as the first. So that's all, all to the well and good. And, and the characters kind of, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say they wrote themselves because it's never that easy, but they do. I, I, I know these characters now and, and they quite often help me by kind of driving the story themselves and, but sometimes that can be a problem, like I want Adam to do something and he he refuses to because that's just not in his character and he ends up doing something stupid or um, irritating. Uh, and <laughs> and I think, well, it would be better for my story plan if you followed exactly what I'd set out for you. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. But But I always think that's when it's working best, when those sorts of things are happening. It always feels like the... The magic is happening somehow. The, the characters are telling me what the story should be, and and I'm I'm going with it and, and hoping for the best. In in fire watching, it, it revolves slightly around a blog post. Um, blogging is quite popular now, but it's moved moved on a bit. You said, as you said, you were writing it over ten years. Did you think about changing that a bit? Um, not really. I mean, the the book is set slightly in the past. Anyway, it's um, it's it's sort of two or three years in the past. Twenty sixteen, I think, is the is the year that it's. Yeah. If you check the dates, that sort of matches up for that year. Um, and you know, blogging is still around. It, it perhaps it is. is done a bit differently now, and it tends to be about specific things like books rather than uh, general kind of diary which the first one which is what mine is sort of in, in fire watching um i didn't want to do the same for night hawking but there's a similar strand in that you you get the um it's the so the book follows the same structure but instead of the blog at the start of each section you get a um a record of fines from from the one of the night hawkers and and then you get a little piece from their point of view so you you see kind of the story progressing um but yeah i didn't i didn't the, 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 when i originally wrote firewatching that the the blog posts were poems actually that the the 
arsonist was writing um and uh then somebody pointed out to me that I really can't write poetry and I had to agree with them. So then, then it had to change and, and, and be something else. And that's when it became a blog. Fair enough. Um, I was thinking about the amount, amount of research that must have gone into the, um, the blog post for fire watching because you, you were looking at uh, historical fires for those sections. What was that like? Yeah, that was that was really fun, actually. I've, I've always been a little bit obsessed with fire, which is perhaps why my first book focused on it so much. Yeah. Um, and I so some of those stories I knew about. Um, I knew obviously I knew about the Great Fire of London and the, the San Francisco earthquake. But a lot of the others were new to me and I spent quite a lot of time researching them and um, the sort of the great fires through history and 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 how they affected things and, and yeah, yeah they're they're fascinating stories in their own right of course then i had to cut a lot of that out because it's kind of irrelevant to the story so they're, they're there for flavor more than anything um and it's that always that case you do loads of research and then you have to take it all out again because there's no room for it in the story with the structure of the book what what was the most difficult thing to to do with the edit, editing because you set it over a full day in each chapter so it must have been a bit yeah uh, that was tricky um and because it changed uh, i re rewrote wrote it rewrote it so many times that the structure changed the the order of event, events changed quite a lot um it, it was it, it was I, it's still the thing i struggle with most actually it was the same with night hawking although night hawking isn't isn't quite the same so it's not um it's not broken up into days this time um it, it goes across about two weeks i think roughly um yeah. but i still struggle but that's something i always do at the end so i just kind of write the story first and then i have a brilliant team of people now thankfully editors and copy editors and so on and my agent who can point out well you know you said here this day's gone on a bit and you, you've mentioned it's dark here but then it's daylight here and and you have to go out oh, and sort of marry all that up and, and make it make sense. Um, it's it's it is the it is the trickiest bit, but thankfully it's the bit that you do kind of at the end. And and most often it's fairly easy to fix, or it's easier to fix than you think it's going to be. I, I think usually. Yeah. Was it the switching perspectives that made you decide to do that? Because it it works with it in a single day. I think with the switching perspectives um yeah I, I i think i didn't want i i'm not very good at I, I like writing in scenes so little chunks of 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 action um i'm not very good at those linking bits where you have uh you know three weeks later and and, and recapping what's happened in the meantime and what people have been up to um i also often don't find those the most interesting bits of the book so by keeping the time scale quite short, there's less time for that, and there's there's less there's less ha hanging around. I suppose it makes for a, a bit of a quicker pace. Um, but it's just, I, I guess, it's just style, really. It's just different styles. That's that's kind yeah. of the way I write. I've, I've found, I've discovered. It does it does add to the tension. What what writers would you say that might have influ influenced that tension? kind of styled speedily um i guess lee child very much so um i'm a big fan of of his and of the of the reacher books um i i very much like this the, the pace of them the way that, that things move forward um but i mean i i've read i read all, all i've read all kinds of things I've, I've read a lot of um obviously in ranking and val he mentioned earlier and and all, all the greats um i I very much like uh, Kate Atkinson's uh, Jackson Brody series as well. I yeah. think they're 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 really good and very character, um, characterful, if you like. Um, yeah, because yeah, I think I think yeah, she was quite a big influence on me, especially when I was when I was starting out. When um, when I when I was reading it, I was thinking. In terms of time scale, I was thinking of Diva because that was the kind of 
way he did it with the open ends of his books and stuff. All oh, right. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a big compliment. <laughs> yeah, because he did it. He did it in days and stuff like that, didn't he? With the bits at the yeah. End. I mean, there are there are lots of books split into days. Of course, it's it's um it's not particularly realistic for a, a, a police procedural operation because often they take months or even years and involve hundreds of people. But you know, as as crime readers, we don't always want that that level of realism do we want <laughs> we want to want to just enjoy the story and and get through it when it when it comes to, when it comes to uh realism how, how did you ensure that um it was real enough that you didn't get um complaints that it's completely unrealistic i don't know to be honest i think you just have to do your best don't you um i I did as much research as I could. I spoke to police officers, both serving and retired. Um, it, it's about presenting it, I guess, as as well as you can, and so so it feels realistic. Um, but it doesn't. It obviously doesn't have to be real. In, in it's the same way you write dialogue in a book. Um, it, it it feels realistic, but actually, if you people don't really speak the way they do in books, you don't. You don't listen to them say every, you know, they don't say good morning, good afternoon, hello, how are you? You, you skip all that bit out. You, you, you move to the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the conversation. So it's a similar thing. Um, you're doing the research and then cutting quite a lot of the research out because you don't want to bore people and then just hoping you've, you've got it right. Um, I'm sure I haven't. I'm sure there are mistakes uh, i'm sure people will point them out to me some already have um but that's fine um hopefully i'll get better and we'll see i'm sure that everyone has uh te teething problems somewhere but i almost have met i didn't spot um <laughs> glaring ones in that <laughs> thank you well, of course, if, if you if you did spot any, I would say, well, those are the ones I put in deliberately. That's that's poetic mm -hmm. license um, to make the story work. Um, when it comes to relationships between the characters, I, I'd say that that's what you're most good at. What what do you think makes you so good at writing relationships and things? Thank you. Um, I don't know. I always try and write. I always try and put myself as much as possible in the person I'm writing about. I, this isn't unique to me, though. It's what all writers do, I guess. Um, you you try and put yourself there and think, right, if I was in this position, how would I feel if this, this had happened to me and that just happened to me? And, you know, where would I go from here? What, what would be the next logical thing to do? Um, it's it's what interests me most about reading and and I guess writing as well. It's it's about I, it's about being human, about understanding other people and why they make the decisions they do. Even people who commit awful crimes, um, what what's what's made them do it, or what's what's driven them to that place. And I think that doesn't that doesn't mean um, we should necessarily forgive them for it, but but I think it's helpful to understand. What, what's brought them there and the same with the if you like the good characters i know i know that adam tyler frustrates a lot of people he, he frustrates me at times um he's not he's not always the best person he could be but that's the person he is and and i like to explore that and try and stay true to that as much as possible he makes he makes mistakes he does things that are not necessarily in his own best interest or or the best interest of others um, but it keeps it interesting. When I first started writing, I think that, that people, people always say, don't they, write what you know, write what you know about. Um, and I think I took that a bit too much to heart. So in the very early drafts, um, Tyler was was a lot more like me and, and it wasn't that interesting. He was a hard character to get right. And once I let him make mistakes and do his own thing and and kind of mess up, he, he suddenly became a lot more interesting. Um, and I think I think that's that would be a, a, a tip I would give people. Let, let your characters let your characters not be perfect. Let them mess up because no one is perfect. People mess up, make mistakes, do do stupid things, and 
that's that's what we actually find interesting. What would you say is his most notable mistake that you turned into a character? character? <laughs> well, I, I I I don't want to give give anything away, so I'll, I'll yeah. let you I'll let you readers decide what you think is his worst mistake. Um, well, it might not be what I think is, but I'll let you choose. <laughs> there's um, quite a few interesting relationships, especially with his boss, because um, she's. She's a, a different relationship than than other police relationships I've seen with Tyler. Yeah, so Jordan is his um, his godmother and kind of helped raise him when his father died um, when he was a sort of teenager. Um, so it's it's quite an interesting relationship, but. Um, it, it, it also it helps it is, it's in his favor sometimes because she gets him out of trouble and, and kind of he probably gets away with stuff that other people wouldn't have done um but i think she also holds him to perhaps a higher standard than than, than others as well and, and she does get on his case quite a lot so he's not, he's not all bad are we gonna hear more about ravani's family in the later books because i think that, that that might be an angle yeah yeah, yeah. There's there is definitely um, more Rabani to come. Um, the uh, the the one I'm writing now. Uh, well, no, I'm not going to tell you too many details. But yeah. yes, you will. Um, the, the this Rabani kind of um, stole the show a bit in Night Hawking, um, which I don't mind, and and seems to have been quite popular. Um, but yeah. she, because because Adam's quite distracted she she kind of got to run with the case and take over a bit um and uh she's had a taste of of what it is to to succeed and be at the top now so she's she's definitely up for more than that but uh, we'll we'll see more of her and i'm sure she'll have her own issues to deal with soon enough um when you first uh, came on the scene you were um your book came, came out during during the lockdown period. What what would you say has been the most difficult thing about that? Um, yeah, it actually came out just before lockdown. So I actually consider myself incredibly lucky because at least I got a launch party and, and I, I got to fly off to America for a week and that was incredible. And then I was on the plane coming home from the States when all the uh, stewards and stewardesses put masks on and it turned out somebody on the plane had covid so that was that was quite scary but yes at least at least i got a taste of that before before lockdown hit proper um i think the worst thing is not have been able to get out there and talk to people about it and and meet people and go to festivals and events so i've done a few bookshop events back this time last year but it was only really a handful, kind of like two or three, um, and then, uh, and then. So I've not had that experience yet. And, and to be honest, that was the bit I was most looking forward to about being a new author, getting out there and meeting people and, and talking to people. Um, but hopefully that will come in the next year. Um, we should see how things go. And uh, yeah, I feel for those people whose debuts have have come out during complete lockdown um i think but it's a real shame for them and and they need our support yeah um what what would you say has been the most interesting event because in the previous life you were working for Waterstones and organized some so mm. you've had an experience that a lot of authors would wouldn't have had as debuts yeah so the best event that i've been involved in organizing yeah of yeah oh um don't know there's there's been a lot so i used to run the buxton festival uh, not i didn't run the whole festival but the, the book side of it i'd um organize the pop-up bookshop that used to appear at buxton and we'd take books to all the events and that was always um fascinating because you got to meet a lot of people and there's something about a fest working a festival that's just brilliant i mean it's it's fantastic because you you get to go into everything and it doesn't cost you anything so that's 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 really good um and uh i managed i 
uh, organized an event with Lee Child as well at, at my shop, which was was brilliant. Obviously, to to host one of your heroes and to to be able to set that up was was fantastic. Uh, from working at uh, Waterstones, uh, what would you say that you've um, you've picked up about how how um, books are marketed that you you might be able to help um, self publish people with? Because we've got a lot of self published authors on the on the group. You see, yeah. Um, well, it's 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 quite different, really, because I think a lot of a lot of self published authors concentrate on the internet side of things for obvious reasons, and and that works really well. Uh, marketing in in bookshops is slightly different. Um, it, it was useful for me to know the way the, sort of the industry worked. Um, it the, the it, sadly there aren't a lot of spaces in in bookshops for for self published works, um, and I think maybe that will change as as more people self publish or the, the the way things go. But um, it. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a tough one. But the 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 market, what the great advantage the self-published um, writers have is that they can do all their marketing online, put themselves out there, you know. And and bookshops are only just beginning publishing as a whole. Really, is only just beginning to really understand how the online model works. I think I think that's true of lots of industries. But publishing, especially because it's such an old industry and it's quite traditional and old-fashioned in lots of ways, um, there's lots of uh, there's lots of opportunity there for 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 different different models of marketing. I think I think this is something only time is going to tell. Really, yeah, going to happen. Um, uh, as a series, uh, what what would you say um, you think? You might um, go, go back and look at some of the characters in pre prequels and things because there's quite a few with the number of characters you've got and, and how long they've been around. Um, for, I know it might be a bit early for a prequel, but I just thought, you know, might, might be it, yeah, it has crossed my mind, Alex. You, you, our, our minds obviously think alike. Um, yes, I, I've got some some thoughts it won't be any time soon um the next book is is pretty much um well it's all planned out and, and i'm writing it now book four i've got a rough plan for um after that we'll see but but yeah i uh I, i've deliberately given myself space i guess and and there are things mentioned from the past which are not always dealt with straight away because I, I thought that would be fun to explore maybe at some point. Um, uh, it, it's, it's good it's good as a writer to leave yourself room to explore and not not hammer down every detail in, in book one. I think that's that's great, especially if you're going to write a series. It's, there's, there's lots we don't know about Doggett's past. Um, there's lots we're yet to find out about Tyler's past and, and Rabani's for that matter. So there's there's a few ways I could go. Um, what, what what would you say that you've um, taken from um, Tyler as a character? Because um, you were talking about that whole noir, and they were saying because um, he's gay and things, and I know that you you gay yourself. Does that um, have you had a lot of um, support from? The community and do you think it's reflected well? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it seems quite popular. Um, I I didn't want to write what might be classed as a gay novel, um, just because that wasn't the story I was writing. I was I was writing a crime story first and foremost, and the main character happens to be gay, um, and. I think that's been quite well received by people because a lot of a lot of um, a, a lot of gay people are, are kind of used to the stories about gay people being about coming out or about being beaten up or about the AIDS epidemic or something. It, it always has to the story always has to be connected to their sexuality, whereas 
I it, I think there's time is time now that we saw some stories where the sexuality just happens to be part of the character. It doesn't necessarily have to be what drives the story, um, and and that's that's certainly what I set out to do. Not saying that those other stories aren't important; they they very much are. But it wasn't what I wanted to tell. I I wanted to tell a story that was a crime story about a police officer um, who happened to be gay, but also happens to be a police officer and somebody's son and somebody's boss and, and, and explore all those relationships as well. Well, it's def it definitely works for me to ex explore that as a non-gay person to find out about it without, yeah, as you say, following those normal lines, if you like. Yeah, yeah, and um, no, it's not, it's, it's, I'm never, I don't think I'm ever going to um, be diving into the realms of erotica or anything like that. And it's just, just not my, uh, not my cup of tea. I'm, I'm obviously as good at that as I am at poetry. So um, you can, you can be rest assured. It, things, things tend to stop at the bedroom door. I don't want to be uh, up for any bad sex awards or anything like that. <laughs> Going back to um, the uh, start of the uh, Nat Hawking, um, mm. what was it about archaeology that um, you found most interesting? Because that seems to be uh, quite a interesting thing with Detectorists being such a popular BBC series and things you could have. You know, it's a really good theme to kind of look at difference, I suppose. Um, yeah, it, it interests me to explore maybe, uh, the main thing was about exploring a crime that is perhaps a bit unusual or a bit different. So it was the this idea that there are people out there who sell antiquities and make money out of it. It's also a fairly peculiarly British thing, I think. It's not, I mean, not, not, solely british at all but it does seem to be quite popular here maybe because of our history and our long history and there, there are lots of things buried and, and around that, that can be dug up so that interests me there's also a strand of the novel that's about um wildlife crime sort of about um smuggling um plants and things so that that kind of it's just those strands really just different sorts of crimes that perhaps are a bit that you wouldn't normally come across in a in a crime novel i'm just trying to trying to look at things like that um i love i love history as well i'm fascinated by history um i'm not much of it an historian but um that that kind of stuff really interests me uh, i must admit i'm a big i'm a big orchid fan myself and it's a bit Big thing in the family when when you're doing the research. Did you find did you find a favourite orchid that you now use, or was it just a pattern? <laughs> I spoke to um, a brilliant uh, a guy at a university who who kind of talked me through how wildlife crime works, and he he works with the police on on this very problem, and it's fascinating. It's a massive massive thing that goes on the smuggling of of rare plants and animals, species, and things. Um, it's much more widespread than you would imagine, um, and it's it's fascinating. He gave me enough material I could have written several books, so I had to kind of dial back on that. And um, but but yeah, I, I'm not I'm not a huge botanist myself, so I don't think my green thumbs stretch as far as orchids yet. I, I can I can just about manage to keep my peace lily alive, and that's that's about as far as I can I can go at the minute. Well, as a big orchid fan, I can tell you, orchids don't need a lot of water, so it might be an option. Do they not? Really. Yeah, I, I do tend to overwater things because I get worried about yeah. them. So, yeah, <laughs> it's probably not a good idea. Uh, as a as a um, as, as a Sheffield man, what was it about Sheffield students in this book that made it? Because it's different from the other background characters, I suppose, in fire watching. Well, I came to Sheffield as a student, um, so that's sort of something that interests me, I suppose. Um, it, we, it's, it's, it, it, I'm always looking for things that represent this city. Um, I, I, I want, Sheff to me, Sheffield is, is another character in the book, 
Um, so the student population is enormous. We, we have sort of over 50,000 students, two universities, a, a big college as well. Um, it's a big part of Sheffield life, the, the sort of student life, um, as is the Chinese population, who, which I, I kind of um, pick up in this book as well. Um, we, we have a, a huge number of Chinese students and uh, money from China coming into the city. And I wanted to explore that and, and sort of um, look into that, th those areas. Um, it, yeah, that, that's part of it. It's, it's part of Sheffield, I suppose. And, and, and I was, I was trying, just trying to reflect that a bit in the book. I'm always looking for new locations um, and sort of going around looking for places. My friends often now, if I, well, not recently, but um, when I used to go on walks with people, they'd, they'd sort of go, oh, you could put a body there. So that would be a good place to hide a body. They, they sort of point things out to me. <laughs> I imagine you've got that c coming back when now that, now that like the now that lockdown's been relieved today, where did you where did you go um, on your walks while while you were writing in order to find these locations that you're talking about? I walk walk all over all over the the city. Really, I live in the city centre, so um, I pick a different route every day and, and and kind of set out and walk around a bit. Slightly running out of places to. Uh, new places to see now um it would be nice to see some people around um again and it would be really nice to get back into coffee shops and start listening to conversations and and uh, i miss all that very much I, I, I write i write quite a lot in in coffee shops and bars and things and um i yeah i'm looking forward like, th these places can't open up soon enough for me i want to get back out there was it as long as it's safe yeah, was it different for you not writing in the coffee shop environment? Because yeah, yeah, it is because I I'm not I'm a terrible procrastinator and I really have to force myself to sit down and start work. Um, and going going out somewhere, it feels a bit like going to the office and and then you get your coffee and there's only so long you can sit there in a coffee shop on your own staring at the wall. Sooner or later, you have to start typing. Um, so I found that was quite good for me. Whereas now I have to force myself to sit down at my desk here, um, start work, um, and and see it through, and not get distracted by all the other things around me. And uh, so yeah, it, it's a challenge, but uh, hopefully I'll be back out there again soon if, if all goes well according to the plan. Well, you've got a few comments on the. So I, um, I can't tell whether the questions are as I'm... Um, Is this on, on, the, on the right hand side here? Yeah. Um, Caroline's written, Ellie G talks about Nighthawking in her latest book as well. What made it come to prominence for you? Yes, I heard about that. I, I need to speak to her actually um, and, and, and give her a line. I, um, I didn't know anything about that until I saw it advertised, but she has, she's got a book out on the same subject. Um, what it made it come to prominence for me? I honestly can't remember. It was it was somewhere way back in the midst of time. I must have read an article somewhere. I'd just written, jotted it down in a notebook. Um, but I know it was a long time ago because even in the very early drafts of Fire Watching, I had Night Hawking as the title for the second book written down. It was it was kind of set in stone from that very early period of, of writing. Long before I knew exactly what the story was going to be. I just knew it was going to be called night hawking, and I knew it was going to start with a metal detectorist digging up a body. Um, and then the next one just says hi all. So, and then Caroline again has asked, "You've written crime and fantasy, I think you said. What other genres would you fancy trying out?" Um, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to write a horror novel. Um, I used to read quite a lot of horror when I was younger. I don't so much anymore. But um, I like a good ghost story or a, a, a sort of creepy story. Um, so I'll, I'll probably get around to that at some point. Um, maybe something historical uh, as well, or just as sort of contemporary novel as well. That's, that's how Fire Watching started out. It was just going to be a sort of contemporary story about people. And then it turned into a crime novel, as I said. But um, I like writing all sorts of things. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever say no to anything else. But at the minute, 
most of my time is taken up with Adam Tyler, so for the foreseeable future anyway. Looking at um, single word titles from your first yeah. two books, is that, is that going to be a theme, do you think? Um, the, the, not, the title's not set exactly for the third one yet, but my plan is that it will be a, a single word gerund again. Um, but um, I probably won't do it much again after that. So the, the third book will kind of finish off the the strand that runs through from fire watching. So it will it will answer a lot of the questions that that I set up in book one and then have developed in book two. So book three will be the culmination of that. So then I think maybe we'll go a slightly different direction, albeit with some of the same characters. Um, so mm. I think then probably the titles will change, but I don't know. Yeah, I, that could, you heard it here first, but it could all change tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's kind of quite answered a few questions for me because um, um, Nighthawking is rather fast paced and it does have a, uh, uh, a uh, complicated arc when you were planning the series um where did, where did you start with the arc and did you always have a second book in mind uh i did but i was aware that i might not get a two book deal or there may never be a second book so i very much wanted fire watching to to be to finish and and to kind of finish but but to leave some stuff hanging um, you know, the main story is answered, the main question, the who done it story is, is resolved. But then just I'd, I'd left a few threads hanging to pick up if I was lucky enough to get a deal where someone wanted me to come back to it. And, and that's what happened. So that worked out quite well. Um, the second one, I was planning originally to just kind of wrap up all those threads for the second one, but then it felt too soon. So I ended up writing a more kind of a, a different story and just developing the threads from the first one and, and bridging to the third one, which the plan is to wrap up a lot of the threads, but they'll still, I'm sure there'll still be some things um, left in the air that I can, I can pick up in later down the line. Um, as tends to be the way I write it appears, um, <laughs> setting up future work for myself. <laughs> well, it de definitely worked for me, especially especially the conclusion for anyone that's not read it yet. Um, Pre-order it now for a great conclusion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Caroline's also said that the side here, you, you said you're a nerd earlier. Would you make a graphic novel of one of your books? I would love to, but I cannot draw. So. Um, Probably not. Um, and, and actually, I, I think I'd, I don't know if I know enough to turn one of my books into a graphic novel. I think I'd rather write a graphic novel of something else and, and kind of write it as a graphic novel. So, um, yeah, but I would definitely, I'd love to write a, write a graphic novel if I knew an artist who was willing to work with me on it because um, no one wants to see my stick figures. Uh, it, honestly, it's just not. Yeah, that's never going to happen. You're never going to see anything I've drawn. <laughs> Knowing that you've uh, got ideas for other other genres, um, what what other genres has stuck out to you that you might read and read and go into besides horror? Um, yeah, well, contemporary fiction, um, historical, maybe. Um, I love. I love sci-fi and fantasy. Um, it was something I wrote more of when I was younger. I, I wrote a fantasy yeah. novel when I was about 15, which was going to be this epic 10 book story of space travel. Um, and then I, I dug it out recently and discovered, actually, it's pretty much a carbon copy of Star Wars, which was obviously on my mind a lot at that time. And uh, so I don't think anything will ever happen with that. because <laughs> It's too derivative. Um, but yeah, I'd like, I'd like I'd like to do something like that. Um, I'm 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 a big Doctor Who fan, so I love time travel and messing about with time and stuff like that. I think I think one day I've got a a big sort of time time heist caper in me somewhere. 
Um, okay. But we'll have to we'll have to see. It's I'm, I'm not writing it at the minute, so we'll see. Oh yeah, because someone needs to do that. There was there was a BBC Two program, I think, a couple of years ago that did it in like two cities or something. Like somewhere in the Russia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I like and and maybe maybe blend the genres a bit as well. I like. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Lauren Bukas, the South African writer and. Uh, she's done a couple of work that are sort of prime fantasy uh, books and i think that's a really interesting crossover and i'd like to maybe have a go at something like that um you you were um first i first spotted you on noir at the bar when you did readings of by watching uh, what um was the most complicated thing about choosing the readings and were you nervous about doing it? Yeah, I'm always nervous about doing anything. Um, <laughs> but I think especially readings because you want to try and read it well. Um, it's tricky. I, I, I suppose fire watching wasn't so bad because it was brand new. So I could just pick a bit from the start and pretty much that would be OK. Um, you, it's slightly harder with Nighthawking because it picks up from where we left off. So, I, But you don't want to be reading the bit where it's recapping everything that's gone before because that's not necessarily the most engaging part of the story. Um, so I've read, I have done a reading, read the, the opening, the sort of the prologue bit. Um, but uh, I will have to be looking through to see what other bits work and uh, maybe splicing bits together. And, and cutting them down to try and come up with something that that, that that works. But yeah, I love I love all that. I love the reading. As as nervous of a, as I get, I do enjoy doing it, and and I like like reading to people and and, and getting an instant response because that's something writers don't often get get unless unless you are a poet and you go out and you perform your work. But um, it's it's rare to get that instant response from an audience that that an actor would get or a um a comedian or something like that and and it's 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 a special moment where you know you hear an audience laugh or gasp or if you're lucky or or, or even just the clap at the end it's it's very yeah it's it's good when, when reading your openings they are very tense um um how many times did you have to go Go over them again, because I know a lot of the authors. Been redrafting oh many times. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't count how many for for fire watching. It was because it was over so many years, and it changed quite a lot. And it, I mean, that wasn't the opening I originally had by any means. It, it it changed very rarely. The first thing I write ends up as the as the opening scene. Um, I tend to pick something else afterwards that I think works better um so yeah they, they, it does it's, it's important to redraft I think I feel that it's, it's the bit that it's the bit you want to get right if you're going to get any bit right you need to go over it and over it and try and make it work the background themes to fire watching were a little bit different as well with the dementia and things um what was it about dementia that made you choose that as a background plot line? Because you seem to like to do background characters, as you, as you said. Uh, your background characters are just as important as your police ones. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I Lily, the, the character in, in Firewatching, who's, who's sort of suffering from dementia, um, she was the start of the story actually it was it was a short story originally that i'd written years ago about an elderly woman in a care home um sort of coming to the end of her life and reliving the past and that's where i got the idea from that's how it started uh and and dementia sort of came as a package because i knew she was her mind was beginning to unravel she was she was confusing present day with past and 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 that seemed the best way to do it. Um, I've always liked elderly characters and things, not necessarily people with dementia, obviously, but 
but I, I find elderly characters in things quite interesting. I, I don't know why. It's just just one of those things I, I like. Um, and then once once you do it, then you kind of think, well, yeah, you do have to explore this a bit and 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 kind of hopefully treat it with some um, respect because it, it's important to try and get things like that right. I think as as much as possible. Uh, we seem to be uh, getting quite uh, close to the end now. What would you say that you've been reading in the in lockdown that you could recommend to our readers? Oh, um, I gosh, it, when you say that, and it immediately goes out of your, out of your head what you're reading. Um, I recently read Alex North's book, The Whisper Man. Um, which I thought was amazing, um, and I, I, I'm a bit late to the party with that because I, I obviously it, it was out a year or two ago. But I, I thought that was brilliant. Um, uh, oh gosh, I'm about to I'm about to launch into uh, Rob Parker's Blackstoke. I think I think I've said that right. I'm not going to yeah. try and make, mix it up and say something that's wrong. Um, that that's the little horror book I understand. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've not started it yet, but that's that's next on my list. I'm, I must admit, I do like to dip into the horror. So I am waiting for that to come out. I know, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think it will be quite good. I know Rob, and I'm sure it will be a cracking tale. So looking forward to that one. Oh, uh, when it was the Whisper Man. Um, there's a ch child character in that. Do you think you'll? Do you think you might fo focus on children in your books, or is that something you'll avoid? Because I know a lot of people generally do want to avoid children occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's not it's not a particular interest of mine um, writing about children. I don't have the children, um, so maybe that's why. Um, although I thought uh, Alex. Did it brilliantly, or Steve? Steve, did, yeah. really, really well done in that. Um, and when it is done well, it, it, it's brilliant. There's nothing better than that sort of uh, childlike voice when people get it right. Sometimes people don't get it right though, and it can be quite annoying. And I don't want to be, I don't want to write a character like that. Having said that, the kind of the extra character in my new in sort of book three, so the one who isn't. The, the one who isn't police is a is a teenage girl, so that's giving me some interesting uh, new things to explore. Which uh, I didn't think I'd write about a teenager, but it, it it worked for the story. And she's a really interesting teenager as well. She's 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 made she's older than her years, shall we say? Which is uh, which is probably just me just not being able to write teenage voice <laughs> well you do seem to come out with uh, lots of different character ranges um why why do you think you're so comfortable about writing so many different characters because some um i just like to mix things up a bit i don't, don't want to write the same character every time and and of, of course the police characters are the same every time so you it, it's a it's a way of me exploring other 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 avenues and getting different voices into the book i suppose yeah, but a very young child. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure whether I could do that. Whether I know enough about the vocabulary of young children to be able to do something like that would be. But I guess I'll just have to do the research. So I, nothing's impossible, is it? It's just about how much time you put in and effort and getting feedback from people about whether it's working or not. Oh, got another thanks. question come up. Uh, yeah, I'm a we'll teacher. Probably make that last one with two minutes left. Yeah. Okay. I'm a teacher and would love to avoid children on a regular basis. It wasn't a question, just a comment. But yeah. <laughs> <clear>. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks so much, uh, Russ, for tonight. And, yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, it's been brilliant. brilliant.